when we have one variable explicitly as a function of the other. For example, if we have y equal to the square root of 9 minus x squared, then we could just take the derivative of both sides with respect to x to find how y changes with x. So if we take the derivative with respect to x of this side, I'm going to write it as 9 minus x squared to the 1 half power. On this side, we get dy dx, right? The rise over the run, the change in y over change in x. On this side, because we have a function inside a function, actually raised to a power, the power comes down. We get the power to 1 less, and then we get times the derivative of what's inside, which in this case is negative 2x. So we find that dy dx is equal to negative x over the square root of 9 minus x squared. See, y was given explicitly. It's spelled out exactly how y depends on x. Sometimes, though, we have an equation, and we don't want to go to the trouble of figuring out what y is in terms of x. Here's an example. x and y have a relationship. I can see that because if I changed x, since this sum has to turn out to be 9, if I make a change in x, I'm going to have to make a corresponding change in y in order to compensate. So y must depend on x in some, how, in some way. So I could ask, how does y change with x? And I could do it without actually solving um, for y explicitly. In this case, we say we have an implicit function. So this word literally means folded in. So information about how y depends on x is folded into this equation. Whether, where in this case it was folded out, right? This was explicit. It was clearly shown how y depends on x. So this is an implicit function. We just take the derivative of both sides with respect to x. We just have to be a little bit careful as we think about this. Now on the right-hand side, the derivative of a constant with respect to x is 0. Over here, the derivative with respect to x of x squared is 2x. When it comes to this, we're taking the derivative of some function of x squared. So in this case, the general power rule applies, right, or the chain rule. The 2 comes down. We get y to 1 power less. But then we have to take the derivative of what's inside, right? Since y is actually a function of x, we have to multiply by the derivative of the inside. So when we do that, we, we get this expression, right, and it involves what we're interested in, dy dx. So we'll go ahead and solve for that. If I, if I take uh, 2x away from both sides, I get 2y dy dx equals negative 2x. And if I divide both sides by 2y, I get negative x over y. Now, actually, these two equations are part of the same thing, right? This is the circle of radius 3. And this is the top half of that same circle. If you squared both sides, you see y squared is 9 minus x squared. So x squared plus y squared is 9. It's just that we have y as only the positive value, so we only have part of this. So if you look at this, this is actually telling us the same thing because the square root of 9 minus x squared is y. So in both cases, we find that dy dx is equal to the same thing. But sometimes it's easier to avoid solving for one of the variables. We had a simpler expression here. And it was, it was a little bit faster, perhaps, to take the derivative of both sides with respect to x and then um, worry about it later. Now, this implicit differentiation technique is really powerful, and it can help us solve a lot of problems. In particular, it can help us take the derivative of um, functions that are inverses of functions whose derivative we already know. Here's an example. Suppose um, you, you want to find the derivative of the natural log. So let's set y equal to natural log of x, and then our task is to find dy dx. So if we knew what the derivative of natural log was, then we would just do it. But if we don't, we can do this little trick. Right now it's an explicit function, but what this is saying is that y is the natural log of x. That means y is the exponent you put on e to get x. Or in other words, e to the y is x. Now we can take the derivative of both sides with respect to x. So we take the derivative with respect to x of e to the y and the derivative with respect to x of x. And let's see, we have e to some function of x. So the chain rule says you take the derivative of the outside, which is just e, e to the y, right? Evaluate the inside, times the derivative of the inside. 
and the derivative with respect to x of x is 1. So dy dx is 1 over e to the y, but we know that e to the y is x, right? So this is 1 over x. Well, that was pretty handy, just knowing that the derivative of um, e to some function is e to the function times the derivative of the function, we figured out what the derivative of natural log of x was. Now we know that if you have to find the derivative of the natu natural log of x, you just get 1 over x. That's pretty handy. Let's see, what would the chain rule say? What if, now that we know the derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x, what if you have the derivative with respect to x of the natural log of some function of x? What would happen then? Well, our outside function is ln, right? So the derivative of the outside would be 1 over x, but evaluated the inside, you'd get 1 over f of x. And then the chain rule says you have to multiply by the derivative of the inside. So you get basically the derivative of the inside of the natural log over the original function. Here's an example. Suppose someone asks you to find the derivative with respect to x of the natural log of x cubed minus 5. Well, you just take the derivative of the inside, which is 3x squared, the derivative of negative 5 is 0, right, over x cubed minus 5. The derivative of the inside over the inside. Whenever you have the natural log of a function, that's the pattern that you follow. The derivative of the inside over the inside. <coughs> Let's see, we could use this technique to figure out the derivative of the arc sine. So, we know what the derivative of the sine is. What's the derivative of the inverse sine? Well, if y is the arc sine of x, that means that the sine of y is x, right? y is the angle between minus pi halves and pi halves whose sine is x. So we also know that, right, that y is between um, minus pi halves and plus pi halves. Now let's use implicit differentiation. We'll take the derivative of both sides. The derivative of the sine of some function of x would be the derivative of the outside, which is cosine, evaluated at the inside, times the derivative of the inside. The derivative of x with respect to x is 1, so that tells us that dy dx is 1 over the cosine of y. Now, I know what the sine of y is. The sine of y is x. I wonder what the cosine of y is. Well, there's a relationship between sine and cosine. The sine squared of y plus the cosine squared of y is equal to 1, right? But we know that the sine of y is x, so sine squared y would be x squared. Now I can solve for the cosine of y. The cosine squared is going to be 1 minus x squared. So the cosine of y would be either the plus or minus um, square root of 1 minus x squared. But we know something else about y y is between minus pi halves and pi halves, so it's over here, and therefore the cosine of y has to be greater than zero, and so we can eliminate this negative. So now we figured out that dy dx is one over the cosine of y, but the cosine of y is the positive square root of one minus x squared. Okay, so if somebody asks you to take the derivative of the arc sine, you know that it's 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. According to the chain rule, if you had to take the derivative of the arc sine of some function of x, let me just call it u, then you'd get the derivative of the outside evaluated at the inside times the derivative of the inside. So, for example, if someone said, what's the derivative with respect to x of the arc sine of um, x squared, and you have the arc sine of some function, right? So you get 1 over the square root of 1 minus the inside function squared. So u in this case is x squared, so if you square that you get x to the fourth, times the derivative of the inside. The derivative of x squared is 2x. So we get 2x over the square root of 1 minus x to the fourth in this case. You could also use this technique to find the derivative of the arctan. Suppose y is the arctan of x. That would mean that the tangent of y is equal to x. Of course, if it's the arctan, we also know that it's an angle between minus pi halves and pi halves. 
Okay, let's take the derivative of both sides. We know the derivative of the tangent is the secant squared. So we get, uh, let's see, the derivative of the outside is secant squared divided with the inside times the derivative of the inside, so we get a dy dx here. And the derivative of x with respect to x is 1. So now we know d, d uh oh, now we know dy dx is equal to 1 over the secant squared of y. Hmm, that's nice, but we don't know what the secant squared of y is. However, we do know that the tangent of y is x, and there's a relationship between the secant squared and the tangent squared, because since cosine squared of y plus sine squared of y is equal to 1, if we divide both sides by cosine squared, cosine squared divided by cosine squared is 1, sine squared divided by cosine squared is tangent squared, and 1 over cosine squared is the secant squared of y. Ah, so when we know the tangent of y is x, so tangent squared of y would be 1 plus x squared. So the secant squared of y is actually 1 plus x squared. That means that the derivative with respect to x of the arctan, that would be dy dx, and that would be 1 over the secant squared, but the secant squared is 1 over 1 plus x squared. Hmm. Okay, so if we had to take the derivative with respect to x of maybe the tangent inverse of a, tangent inverse of oh let's say e to the x plus x squared, then we would get the derivative of the outside evaluated at the inside. So I'm plugging the inside in here times the derivative of the inside. Well, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, and the derivative of x squared is 2x. So we get here e to the x plus 2x all over 1 plus e to the x plus x squared all squared. Hmm. 